sacrifice that you gave your life for us Lord we do this in remembrance today in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 
verse 23, Paul said, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And in the same manner, let us also break of the bread and partake. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In verse 25, the Bible says, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And this do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And in the same manner let us also partake of the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he's coming soon. I said he's coming soon. Hallelujah. 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 As you're seated this morning, Stacy came down a few moments ago and shared that the Lord had spoken a word to her and I just want her to share that before I preach this morning I heard the Lord say as we were worshiping that our worship this morning the Lord was doing a work as we worshiped he was tearing down walls and breaking up the fallow ground of our hearts in our minds because he wants us to hear the word that's about to be preached we need it he said we need it and our hearts weren't ready but as we worshiped the Lord was working our hearts and our minds so that we would hear the word of the Lord this morning and apply it to our lives. Thank you, Lord. Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. Have your way in this place, we pray. Hallelujah. Church, God has called us to be worshipers. You are called by God to be a worshiper. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be on the stage with Steve and the rest of the team. That means that your life is to be worshiped to the Lord. Worship isn't an optional thing for a Christian. And this morning, I want to start a new series called Made to Worship. Made to Worship. We were created for a purpose. God created you for the purpose of worshiping him. That's the reason that we exist, is to worship him. In Revelation chapter 4, I want to share some scripture with you today. The very last book in your Bible, Revelation chapter 4. And some people look at Revelation and think, oh, it's so confusing. I don't want to read it. But there's some incredible truth in the book of Revelation. And... Um, when you start off in uh, Revelation, uh, John talks about a vision that he had had of Jesus. And then he goes on to write about what he had already seen, the things that are past, then the things that are, uh, he says in chapter 1. And that is, that is the current things at that time. There were seven letters to seven churches. That's in chapters 2 and 3. And then he said, and write the things which shall be hereafter. Everybody say the word after. And that really starts in chapter 4, verse 1, and goes through the rest of the book. And so we're going to be looking at verse 4, where John was taken up 
to heaven. John was taken up to heaven, and uh, we're going to be reading in verse 9, but as I was rereading the scripture again today, the Lord pointed something out to me that, to be honest, I had just read it over uh, yesterday and hadn't really noticed, but today the Lord just pointed something out to me. I don't have it on the screen, but if you look in your Bible in Revelation chapter 4, the very first verse of Revelation chapter 4 says this, after these things I look and behold, everybody catch this, a door standing open in heaven. He said, I looked and I saw in heaven an open door. God spoke over our church this year that it would be a year of open doors. John said, when I got this revelation, all of a sudden I looked up to heaven and there was a door and it was already open in heaven. What God does in heaven, he wants to release down here on earth. God wants us to live in a season of open doors where he's opening new things to us that come down to us from heaven. And then he goes on to say, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I'll show you things which must take place after this. And this is the after. This is what's going to happen. And if you read on in chapter four, you know what he talks about? He talks about worship. He says, when I got to heaven, all of a sudden I, I, I realized that there were these 24 elders. There are 24 that represent all of the church of all ages, and they're around the throne, and they're worshiping the Lord, and there are these beasts that are around the throne that are created by the Lord, and they worship him night and day and day and night. Can I tell you that, you know, the greatest worship that you've ever experienced here is really nothing in comparison to what you're going to experience when you go to heaven. Don Piper wrote in his book, 90 Minutes in Heaven, when he actually died and went to heaven, he said, I didn't just hear music. He said, it seemed as if I were a part of the music. And I know that I haven't had in my life many visions. I haven't had a lot of things like that. But I know there was one time, and it's been now um, about 18 years ago, and the Lord, on one night, we were here in a service, and the service started at 7 o'clock, and I think it was around 2 or 2.30 in the morning, and, and uh, was still here, and uh, was up actually at that point. I had been playing the keyboard, and I was laying on the floor underneath the keyboard at that point. And uh, almost everyone was gone, but we were praying and the Lord came down and God gave me, I mean, I, I knew that I was, my body was here, but I went to heaven and I experienced, I, I worshiped the Lord. It was unlike any worship we've ever had. There was a total just carefree feeling of there was no worry, there was no care, everything that, all the burden that you're under that you don't even realize you're under was released and we were just in the presence of the Lord. I mean, it was the, the most freeing feeling to just worship the Lord there. Can I tell you that when that's what God created our relationship with him to be, when we get to heaven, that's when we're really going to experience that kind of worship. Is that good? If you jump down to verse 9, this is really where I want to preach to you. Revelation chapter 4, verse 9. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and they worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and and honor and power. And then look what he says. For you created everything. And it is for your pleasure that they exist and were created. You were created to bring pleasure to him. The reason that you exist is for his pleasure. You, you're breathing just for him. Sometimes we kind of make the, the opposite assumption that God is there for us. We're here for him. 
We're not the center. He's the center. Somebody say amen. We exist to bring pleasure to him. And how does that pleasure happen? It happens by the very act that we just read, and that is through worship. When we begin to worship him, it brings pleasure to him. We were created to worship. We were created to worship. Are you hearing me? We exist to bring pleasure and honor and glory to him and to his name. When you do the thing that comes most natural to you, it's worship. Are you catching that this morning? God's desire is for you, his child, to come to his presence. It brings him pleasure. And then you are the most fulfilled that you'll ever be. Is that good? He wants to be near you. He wants you in his presence. Because here's what happens when you start worshiping him. Worship brings intimacy with the Father's heart. Some Christians were saved, but we really aren't close to the Father's heart. We're part of his family, but we really aren't hearing his heartbeat like we should. And he doesn't want that. You know, it's, it's one thing. You have children, and you may have multiple children, and you may have uh, children that, that maybe your relationship with them is kind of strained. It doesn't mean they're not your children. They may be doing things that, that they're walking in disobedience to you. That doesn't mean they're not your kids anymore. You still love them. But how much pleasure is it when your children have your heart and your heart is for them and their heart is for you and you walk together and and God just blesses in that relationship and that's the relationship he wants with us, that we draw near to him, that we listen closely to his voice, that we have intimacy and we know what he's speaking. Can I tell you that the connection that you have with the creator of the universe is through worship. Can you think about that for just a moment? When you start worshiping, it's not just music and it's not just songs. Literally ascends beyond this realm, beyond the flesh. And all of a sudden something happens in the spirit. All of a sudden in heaven, God's up there and we're connecting to him. Can I tell you the closest thing that you'll ever experience on this earth to what's going to happen in heaven is when the church comes together in unity in worship. When you get in worship, and I mean not just singing songs. Sometimes we sing songs and sometimes we play patty cake. But sometimes we really just push everything else aside and we say, I just got to get in your presence, Lord. I just want to be with you. And we press past everything else and every struggle and every trial. And we just say, Lord, I'm just here for you. And I just want to worship you. And his presence comes down. That's the closest that you'll ever get to heaven on earth right there. And there are so many Christians that don't even realize what that is. They're worshiping him from afar. You don't have to worship him from afar off. You can draw close to him. You know what worries me? What concerns me are Christians that have a take it or leave it attitude about worship. It concerns me. You know, it used to be if you were committed to the church, that meant I'm there three services a week and maybe more if there's revival. Not a lot of amens on that one. And then commitment started to mean, well, two times a week. And then commitment started to mean, well, one time a week. And now commitment means, well, I might show up one time a month. I'm in, I'm committed. And we have a lackadaisical attitude toward the church coming together in worship. And it's not only about our attendance. It's about the posture that we have when we enter. We don't.
don't prepare ourselves for his presence. We walk in any old way. We just come in thinking about any old stuff. Listen, when you walk in here, you shouldn't be talking about the ball game. You shouldn't be talking about all the other junk that's going on in your life. You shouldn't be just going on about everything else when you come in here. You ought to start worshiping him. You ought to start focusing on him and pushing everything else aside because he's coming to meet with his people. It's the most important thing that we'll do. We were created to worship him. We shouldn't take it as a second class thing. It shouldn't just be something that's added on to our life. We shouldn't just have a take it or leave it attitude about worship. It's the highest calling of your life and my life is to worship him. He's looking for worshipers. He's looking for people who will say, Lord, I don't know what else I am, but I know I'm a worshiper. I may mess up on a lot of other stuff, but I, Lord, I'm going to run back to you. I'm going to get at your feet and I'm going to worship you with everything I have. Because when I get in your presence, Lord, when I get in your presence, that's when things change. When the presence of the Lord comes down, that's that's when the atmosphere changes in the room. God comes down and meets with his people. It's the closest thing to heaven. What happens is we actually reach beyond this earthly plane. And similar to what happened to John, it's like God says, open, open the door. Come on up here. I don't know if you could have been there on the day on the Isle of Patmos when John was taken up and he heard him say, come on up here. I don't know if it happened physically. If you were watching John, I don't know that his body went to heaven. I think John's body may have been here, but his spirit went to heaven and he had this experience. Because God said in that moment, open that door right over there. Open that door. He's worshiping me. See, some of you aren't quite getting this yet. Because when you really worship, I don't mean you just sing songs. I don't mean you just start going along with what the worship team's doing. I mean when you really press aside everything and the church comes together in worship. I think God just says to one of the angels, Hey, hey! Open the door over there toward Conneaut, Ohio. There's some people down there and they're worshiping me. And all of a sudden, I want that worship to not be contained in that room down there. All of a sudden, I want to bring them on up higher. I want to bring them on up here. I want them to have my presence. His presence is heaven. I need to hurry. See, worship opens the door to his presence. Worship opens the door to his presence. We're living in 2017, and God has spoken over 2017 that it's a year of open doors. Amen. And he's saying, I want a new door to open of worship and my presence will come like you've never experienced. See, when we really worship, the atmosphere starts to change. Some of us are sometimes so focused on everything in the natural that we are sometimes unaware of what's happening in the spirit. I'm going to put myself there because I often, I'm in that place and all of a sudden, you know, it's like the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit kind of comes up and goes upside my head. It says, hey buddy, you're getting a little too focused on what you're seeing in the flesh. And all of a sudden I realize, whoa, whoa, there's a lot more going on here than I realized. When you begin to worship him and you have a sensitivity to the spirit, you can sense that the atmosphere in the spirit changes. Now, the room temperature is the same. I mean, the barometric pressure didn't change in the room. It's not that there's a front coming through in the natural, but all of a sudden in the spirit, things change. I told you about the one time, the, the ladies' prayer group. I appreciate so much the ladies and the prayer group. They pray here on Thursday. They'll come in and pray. They prayed for me Thursday. I, I walked in and greeted everybody. They said, Pastor, can we pray for you? I said, absolutely. Pray for me. I need it. 
They were praying, they used to pray over in the old sanctuary, and my office was up in front, and so when they would be praying, my office was all the way up in the corner up there, while when they did prayer meeting, I would go back in the youth room, and that was my time to get everything set up, and all the things I had to do to get ready for youth group, and I'd let them kind of have the sanctuary, and so I was back there getting everything ready, and going over stuff, and setting up, and doing, getting worship stuff ready for Wednesday night, and whatever, back then the prayer meeting was on Tuesday, so they, they had finished in the, in the sanctuary, and they had left by the time I come back through. And I came walking through. And you know how when ladies, you know, they, they smell better than we do. You can tell they've been in the room because when I walked in, there was a fragrance of the perfume of the ladies that had just left that had been up there around praying. And when I got up toward the front, I could smell it. But then all of a sudden, I sensed more than what was just in the natural. There was just the presence of the Lord that those ladies had prayed down right in that place. And I just walked into it. I mean, I just started weeping because I walked right into the atmosphere of his presence that they had just opened the door from heaven and said, some of his presence had just leaked right on out. And that's what happens when we get, begin to praise him. He opens a door and his presence just starts to leak right on out here to earth. And we get some of heaven coming down here on earth. Adam and Eve experienced that. That's what God created us for. He created Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden. And when he did, he said, I'll be here every day. Every day I'm coming down. And we're just going to have some time together. And we're going to commune together. I tell you what, that would, be, that would be the part of the day I would look forward to more than anything else. It doesn't matter what else is going on. He's coming down to meet with me. He's, I've got a, everything else that you did would lead up to the point that he comes down and his presence is here. And that, that song, I think, that we sing just describes it so well. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. And the joy that we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. If it's been a while since you've been in his presence, you were created for worship. And that worship opens the door to his presence coming in. You don't have to worship him from afar off. In the Old Testament, that's what they had to do. His presence was in the temple. And the temple was kind of had sections. So there was an outer court. Some people were only allowed in the outer court. Then there was an inner court that others would come into. And then there was a holy place. And the, the priests would go into the holy place. But then there was a huge veil that was six inches thick. And that veil separated the holy place from what was called the most holy place, the holiest of all, or the holy of holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was that had the mercy seat where God's presence dwelled on this planet. Only the high priest could enter there. Only the high priest one time a year could go in. No one else had ever even witnessed or seen what happened in the, the holy of holies. They had to worship him from afar. But when Jesus died on Calvary, the Bible said that that curtain, that veil that was six inches thick, everybody go like that with your fingers, six inches thick. That's a thick piece of material that was woven it was torn in two from the top to the bottom. God the Father reached down and I think he grabbed each side of that and he said, I don't want to be separated from my people anymore. I don't want them to have to worship me from afar. I want them to come right into my presence. And he ripped that thing right down from the top to the bottom. That's what Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary did for us. We can boldly enter the throne of grace. We can find help in our time of need. We can worship him and his presence will come right down where we are. Yes. Yes. 
Psalm chapter 22 verse 3 says this. But you are holy. Enthroned in the praises of Israel. Where is God's throne? God's throne is where he is worshipped. That word enthroned is the Hebrew word yashav. It means he dwells there. He inhabits there. He sits down there. He abides there. He continues there. He remains there. That's what that word means. He says, this is where I take up residence. Whenever you worship me, I'll continue. I'll continue. I'll stay. You ever get in a worship service and you have his presence and you just don't even want to move? It's like, I just don't want anything to disturb this. I don't, wanna, I don't want anything to stop the presence of the Lord from being like this. Do you know that he promises to remain, to stay, to continue? And what we have to do is we have to say, I want to take a stance of continual praise so that I will have his continual presence. Did you hear that? You want God to take up residence in your life? Then you need to say, I'm going to be a worshiper every single day. It is not a Sunday morning deal. It's not something we do for about 20 or 30 minutes on Sunday morning. I want to become a worshiper. I want to have worship be the first instinct in my life. When something happens good, I want to begin to say, Jesus, thank you so much because you did that. When something happens bad, I want to say, Jesus, I thank you you already knew about about this and you've already got the solution. When somebody gives me information, I want to say praise you Lord. God, whatever it is, you already knew about this. When somebody comes and they share something good, I'll say praise the Lord. We ought to always have his praise on our lips. See, God does not want us to come to worship. Can I meddle just for a minute? See, the problem is when we only view worship as something that happens in this room, then we we segment it, and he's not intending that to happen. We are to be worshipers. So I hear this phrase. I I hear people say, I'm going to get my praise on. I'm going to put my worship on. And I understand the the sentiment, but can I say that I don't agree? I disagree with the statement because I am a worshiper. Saying that I'm going to get my praise on or get my worship on implies that when the service is done, I'm going to take it back off and put something else on. That's the problem. The problem is, I'm going to go get my praise on. And then when the praise is done, I'm going to take the praise off. I'm going to, I'm going to get the garment of heaviness back on. I'm going to go out in the world now. And then I have to come back and i got to put the garment of praise back on again because i got the spirit of heaviness. Can I tell you, it doesn't have to be a Sunday morning thing. You can live a lifestyle of worship and have His presence just flow in your life every day, every morning, every afternoon, every evening, in the middle of the night. You can be a worshiper. You can have worship flowing right in your home. You can have worship flowing on your job. You can have worship flowing when you're walking through the mall. Got that. I got a little Bluetooth thing for my phone. You ever hang around people and they got that Bluetooth thing? And they're wearing it. That can cause some confusion in conversations. Because you're talking to somebody for about five minutes. And you don't notice that they happen to go like this. And they say, hello? And you think, wait a minute. Why are you saying hello? We've been talking for five minutes. And they're having a different conversation. And you don't realize. You ever have that? You don't realize they're on the phone for a minute? Sometimes I'll use that. I'll put that on. And I'll just be walking around at Walmart. 
but my phone's playing worship music. And nobody else even knows, but I'm just opening a door in Walmart. I'm just walking around. I have the presence of the Lord right there, right wherever I'm going. I'm just praising the Lord. I'm just singing along. And I'm not singing real loud where I'm disturbing everyone. Maybe I am disturbing people, but I don't really care. I'm just there worshiping the Lord. His presence, I'm telling you, His presence will come down at Walmart. His presence come down in my car all the time. All the time. I'll be driving down the road just singing and worshiping the Lord. I'll be speaking in tongues just driving down the road. Sometimes I have to pull off the side of the road because His presence, He just opens up a door from heaven and all of a sudden His presence just kind of overflows out of my car. I think if I rolled the window down, I'd have His presence just flowing out all over the highway. I'm telling you, the problem is we segment our lives to feel that worship is a segment. It's not a segment. It's, that is what we are called to be. It's our identity. I am a worshiper. Is that good? I can't, I can't take it off. See, when it's who you are, it's not something that I have the option of take off, put on, take off, put on, take off, put on. It becomes who I am. Any more that I could say, well, right now I'm a Christian. But then, I don't know, 2 o'clock, I don't know if I'll be a Christian anymore. But boy, we're going to have church tonight at 6 o'clock. I'm going to put Christian back on again. No, my identity is I am a Christian. I'm called by his name. Is that good? He has called me a worshiper. That's the identity that I've chosen. Not, not just some segment of my life of, of an action that I do. And if we'll realize that, you know what it opens the door to? It opens the door to his presence and his power in your life. Any day, any time, you just need to say, right now I'm just going to start worshiping him and a door is going to open in heaven. See, worship and praise, they're always important. And I've told you before, there's only two times when it's appropriate to praise the Lord. When you feel like it, and when you don't. Those are the only times that it's appropriate to praise Him. But if you only praise Him when you feel like it, then you have a very shallow and very emotional only relationship with him. I don't walk by my feelings. He's still God when I feel him or when I don't feel him. He's still worthy of my praise when I feel like praising him and when I don't feel like praising him. Can I tell you that when you're going through difficult times and hard times, it's so much even more vital to be a worshiper, to praise through those times. When it doesn't come naturally, it's easy to praise him when it comes naturally. I mean, God does a miracle. It's easy to praise him when you've been praying about something, you see the answer. It's easy to praise him then, but it's more important to praise him when you don't feel like it. Last point, you can praise your way through. You can praise your way through. You're going to go through some stuff in this life. Nobody's shouting amen right there. You're going to go through some hard times in this life. And you're going to find some stuff that you can't fight your way through. You're going to find some stuff that you can't figure your way through, that you can't bluff your way through, that you can't buy your way through, but you can praise your way through. If you will adopt an attitude of praise, it doesn't matter what you're facing. You just say, it's not going to shut me up. I'm going to keep on praising him. See, your praise is a weapon against the enemy in your life. 
Can I tell you when I was struggling in Cleveland Clinic in, in the ICU unit and I was having difficulty even breathing, I was I refused to stop praising him. My my wife would she made up scriptures, she would write them up, she put them all over the wall. She came in, we had tape everywhere. By the time we got done, they probably had to come in and repaint the room. She had scripture everywhere I looked. She brought things and put them up on that little stand that they bring up to put your food on. She she had the word of God in front of me all the time. I just continued. I let everybody know, God's going to heal me of this. God's going to get glory. Somebody say, well, wait a minute. You can't praise him. Maybe he's not going to do it. You can praise him for what he's done. You can praise him for who he is, but you can also praise him for what he's going to do. You can praise him for the victory that he's going to bring. You can praise him in advance and know that he's a God of his word. (sighs) See, if you... Sometimes we praise him. It's easy to praise him when the church is all together and the worship team comes up. Don't we have an anointed worship team? Oh, I'm so thankful for our worship team. Wow. They come up and open up the service today. And, 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 and Steve comes up and says, today is a brand new day. Let us lift a shout of praise. Isn't that an awesome song? He wrote that. Did you know that? He wrote that. Let us in worship today. You know what? I just I praise God for them. But it's easy to worship God. When everybody in the room, you got a couple hundred people with you and we're all singing, it's easy to worship God then. The devil wants to steal that praise out of your life because that praise is the open door to his presence. His presence breathes life into you. If he can steal your praise by getting you into something that is so hard and so difficult that you stop praising, then what he wants to do is stop the flow of God's presence and God's anointing in your life. He wants to silence your song. Are you catching this today? You have to be unwilling to relent in worship. You have to be unwilling to give the devil your song. Don't give him an opportunity in your words. Sometimes I hear Christians talk about things and I think, my goodness, I know you may be struggling, but stop giving the struggle and the trial and the stuff that the enemy's bringing all the glory in your life. You need to start saying, you know what? It's been hard and the enemy's fought, but I praise God. God, because I know he's about to show up. I know my God, and I know that he's never forsaken me. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed out begging for bread, so I'm going to keep on praising him. (sighs) Sometimes you say, but pastor, it's so hard. That's when you need to praise him the most. We need to get a praise that the devil can't steal. Say, but pastor, you don't know what the doctor said. I understand how that is. But I tell you, I know who the great physician is. And I know what he said. And I know what his word said. And I'm going to keep on praising him. Say, but what if if God doesn't answer the way that we want? You know what? What if God doesn't answer the way we want? What if? What if? What's the worst thing that the devil could do? Whoa, he could kill me. Now I know nobody here is, you know, looking forward to that happening. But let's just say that it was your time. First of all, the devil can't kill you. That's all in God's hands anyway. But the last enemy to be defeated was death. Jesus already took care of that. The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The second that you close your eyes here, you're going to begin worshiping at a level like you never even could have thought of in your mind. You're going to open your eyes and see Jesus face to face and worship in his presence. What's the worst thing that could happen is the best thing that could happen. Hmm. Hmm. 
See, we need to stop being so mamby-pamby and worshiping only when it feels good and only when everything's going right and only when we're in the middle of a bunch of people that are celebrating. You need to learn to worship at midnight. You got to learn to worship in the dark times. We got to learn to we got to learn to lift up a praise when we don't feel like it. We need to learn to shout when nobody else is shouting. We need to learn to praise him when everyone else is silent. We need to learn that when the enemy comes and he roars like a lion that we say, "Wait a minute. I know the lion of the tribe of Judah and he has prevailed. He has prevailed. I know who my faith is in." He has always held my hand. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know he's got it in control. I will not stop praising him. (sighs) When it's midnight, that's when you need to praise like never before. Some of you are going through hard times right now. And can I tell you that God's saying that the key to your victory is praising when you're going through it. Praising when you're in the hard time. Praising when you haven't seen the answer yet. What if you were arrested and beaten, thrown in prison, and left there? That was the situation for a guy named Paul and Silas. They were arrested and beaten and thrown in prison just for preaching in Jesus' name. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, (laughs) the Bible said, But at midnight. Everybody say, at midnight. You got to praise him at midnight. You got to praise him in the dark time. You got to praise him when you don't see the light coming through. You got to praise him when you haven't seen the answer yet. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Paul was not known for his incredible worship leading voice. I don't know if Silas had a great ability to harmonize and catch a perfect third above where Paul was at. As a matter of fact, a couple of preachers most likely wasn't sounding real good to the ear. But notice, the prisoners were listening to them. You know why you need to praise him in the hard times? Because somebody's listening. See, if I would have been in the prison, I would have been saying, Oh God, please get me out of here. Oh God, I didn't deserve this. What were they doing? They were over there singing, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Oh, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. When Paul and Silas started singing, I don't think that they sang for the benefit of the other prisoners. But the other prisoners were listening. Everybody got quiet when they sang. (sighs) See, some of you, you don't even know it. But there are people that are bound. And they're watching. And they're listening. There are people that are watching you and they are in bondage. And when you get in midnight, when it's dark, and you decide, I'm going to keep on praising Him in the middle of the storm. There are some people around you and they're listening to the song that you're singing. But I'm so glad that even though they were listening... They weren't the target audience. 
when you begin to worship, you have an audience of one. He's listening. He's listening. He's up in heaven, and I think they started singing, and I think on his throne, he said to an angel, hey, hey, open up a door over here to this jail over here. There's, there's some people down here in Philippi in jail, and they just started praising. Open up a door. All of a sudden, the sound of Paul and Silas singing together in that jail cell didn't just reverberate down here on earth. I think up in heaven, I think all of a sudden through the halls of heaven, everybody could hear because a door was open. And all of a sudden, the voice of Paul and Silas joined with thousands through the ages, with all those that are around the throne, with billions and billions of angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. I think that all of a sudden, whatever song that they had been singing up there, they started singing what Paul was singing in that moment. And all of a sudden, the atmosphere of heaven started to just flow right down there to that little jail. You know, the, the Bible talks about where heaven is and where earth is. And I think that God was up there in heaven and he's just listening. He said, oh, I hear him down there. I hear him there. They're singing and he started to like the singing and I like what I heard an old preacher say all of a sudden God started tapping his foot when God started tapping his foot the Bible said heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool all of a sudden he started tapping his foot a little louder and a little bit harder and all of a sudden his footstool started shaking all of a sudden the jail started quaking all of a sudden down here all the things that had held them captive were destroyed Destroyed. The Bible said in verse 26, suddenly, somebody say, suddenly. suddenly. You start worshiping him, you never know what might happen suddenly. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. Can I tell you, there are some people who need to have chains loose and it's going to happen through your praise. If you'll start praising him in the middle of midnight when it's dark and black, everyone's chains were loose I don't know how you're still sitting in your seat somebody stand up and give him the highest praise come on somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph Praise the Lord. 
your problem is, but I know who your answer is. I said, I don't know what your problem is, but I know who your answer is today. And the access that we have to Him is through our praise as we begin to worship His name. He's present in this house. Now, if you need something from the Lord this morning, I want you to move quickly. I want our leaders, our elders, and their wives to come right up front.